Grace, peace, and mercy from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. Kind of get settled in. We're going to be here for a bit. That's what this is for. October 16th through the 28th in 1962. Do you remember that? There you go. I did not write this beginning. I actually grabbed it from someone else. And as I pieced it together and I saw that, man, how ironic to have this today in what we're going through now. In those 13 days, a nuclear war was averted. The Soviet Union was shipping nuclear missiles to Cuba. 90 miles away from us. I remember when I was a kid, it seemed like a long ways, but I was living in Michigan. The Russian ships, or Soviet Union at the time, had every intention to break the naval blockade. Delivering their nukes to Cuba. An American reconnaissance plane was shot down. And one person thought, well, actually the United States Secretary of Defense thought that would be the last Saturday he would ever see. But through intense negotiations with John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, probably some very harsh words, probably a lot of threats, the Soviet ships turned around. No nuclear missiles landed or launched. No World War III crisis averted. We need to remember that. Crisis averted. In our text today, God's people are reaching a crisis point in Jeremiah for the very survival. And God sends the prophet Jeremiah to speak some very harsh words. The question is, Will they heed these words and the crisis be averted? Whether we today know this as well as we should, we are ever on the brink of a crisis, one of nuclear proportions. Have you ever seen pictures of a nuclear bomb going off? Remember as a kid, we'd see those movies. There's nothing left. This crisis that threatens us, this spiritual crisis, is one of nuclear proportions. One that threatens our very survival. And the question is the same for Jeremiah's hearers in our text. Will God's word preach to us, avert the crisis of our eternal disaster? Despising the preaching of God's word creates an eternal crisis. Threatening desolation and damnation. That was the point God's people, the kingdom of Judah, because they were rejecting the word of God. They were rejecting Yahweh himself. Jeremiah had just spoken all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to the people. Through Jeremiah, God was accusing them of going after other gods, including 
promiscuity, disobeying God's commandments, sexual sins, and that evil worship. They were turning their backs on God, who had redeemed them out of Egypt, brought them into the promised land. Through Jeremiah, the great I am was pronouncing desolation for Jerusalem and the temple. This house, the temple, shall be like Shiloh. Some 450 years before, Israel had taken the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, from its place in Shiloh into battle against the Philistines as a good luck charm. This was not pleasing to God. So he allowed the ark to be captured by the Philistines and Shiloh to be destroyed. Because of Judah's sin and stubborn impenitence, Jeremiah proclaimed that the temple and Jerusalem would be the same. Desolate, slain, laid in ruins, dried up, destroyed, taken away. The temple had become Judah's idol. People don't take too kindly of idols being threatened and taken away. But God's not to be toyed with. His patience was running out. The enemies of God were hearing their judgment. And they, they reacted with hate and murder. Quite a remarkable scene. You see in 8 through 11. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people... Then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, you must die. The prophet of God, they're saying, we don't like what you're saying, so we're going to, you must die. It all happened at once. Jeremiah finishes preaching God's word. The corrupt priests and false prophets lay hold of him, accuse him, and threaten to kill him. And like a playground fight about to break out, all the people rush together. The officials hurry to their seats at the place where criminals are judged. A prophet of God. They're going to judge him like a criminal. They demand death for this one who prophesied against the temple and the city, they made their God. There before the hostile crowd, Jeremiah tells them that he speaks for Yahweh, for God, and he calls them to repent. If they repent, if they turn to the Lord, God will relent of the disasters he's pronounced upon them. But they refuse. For Judah and Jeremiah, this is a moment of crisis. Either for peaceful resolution or catastrophe. From the time of Adam and Eve's fall and the sin, the whole world teeters on the edge of crisis of nuclear proportions. We are all headed toward eternal catastrophe in hell. We have not given up our gods. We worship our carnal desires. We've put our trust in things of plastic and glass and steel. We lie and cheat for temporal things that last such a short time. It's rebellion against God. We have heard the voice of our pastor accuse us of our sins and call us to repentance, yet we are so turned in on ourselves that we have neither the desire nor the will to do anything but sin. And as we descend into this journey of Lent and continue to live all the days of our lives, we know we are in crisis. 
We know the wages of sin is eternal death. We know we have been brought forth in inequity. We have been born in the sin. We know we have done what is evil in the eyes of our Lord. The crisis is before us. We are lost and condemned creatures. No negotiations, no trying to do better on our part can bring a peaceful resolution. But there's a way out of this crisis that threatens our condemnation. The living word made flesh intervenes in the crisis. When we spoke of Jeremiah being brought before the priests and the prophets and all the people, did it sound a little familiar? Could you not see, could you not hear the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, and all the people scurrying to their places and bringing Jesus before Pilate and demanding his death? Sound familiar? Jesus was speaking all that the Father had commanded him. And the Father even instructed the people, had sent, this is my son. The Father said, this is my son I love. Listen to him. God had sent many prophets like Jeremiah, Isaac, Micah, and they were murdered. As Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. God sends many prophets into the vineyard to preach repentance and salvation, and each is beaten and killed. Now he sends the Son, God in the flesh. This is only the the only way the crisis of our damnation could be averted. If God himself were to live the commandments perfectly in our place, take the punishment of our, for our sins into his own flesh and shed his blood in payment for our sin, it is God's love for us that averts the crisis. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Lord relents of this epic crisis by shedding his innocent blood for you and for me. On the cross, Jesus gathers his wayward children as hens gather her brood under her wings. On the cross, Jesus dies desolate as the Father forsakes him in our place and claims us as his own. On the cross, Jesus gifts us with our citizenship in heaven. even as we now await his blessed return to take us to heaven forever. On the cross, Jesus declares, it is finished. The debt is paid. Your sins are forgiven. The crisis is averted. For us then, the crisis is averted when we believe the preached word that calls us to repentance and delivers us the living word. It turned out, in the verses immediately after our text, cooler heads prevailed. Jeremiah wasn't killed. But 22 years later, Judah was dragged off into captivity to Babylon. The temple was raised. Gone, the temple. If you go to there today, there ain't nothing up there. 
The temple destroyed, leveled, raised. Jerusalem was destroyed, just as Jeremiah had warned. The people had never really taken God's word to heart. Paul wrote to the Philippians in our epistle, Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm. This means we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. The founder and perfecter of our faith. This means we cling to him through this desolate journey in life. Through the struggles. Whether we're in sadness or joy, whether we're prosperous or poor, whether we're living in the joy of life or suffering, ills, and persecution. Imagine being an Ukrainian mother, a Christian mother. or father, or son, or daughter. Jesus is our joy and treasure. He is the one thing needful. He is our life and our salvation. And we hear the voice of the prophets today, our pastors who preach God's word to us. And just like the Israelites, Just like Judah, sometimes we don't like what we hear. Sometimes I don't like what I hear when I see the law of God accuse me of my sin. But when I'm confronted by the law, when I see in the mirror who I am, how much more do I appreciate what Jesus has done for me? And we live a life of repentance. We live in our baptism. Because daily the old Adam is trying to to come back up. Almost to be resurrected. And we got to keep killing him. (laughs) The sin. The sin that tries rising up within us. But we thank God that in Christ Jesus, because on the last day, when Jesus comes back, that'll be finished. That'll be done completely. We won't have to worry about the old Adam coming up, because we will be a new creation. But until then, we keep gathering. We come before our Lord. And we live daily. A life of contrition. Yes, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. And then a Lord and and sword saves, says, as far as the east is from the west, your sins are forgiven. They are remembered no more. And they're gone. The crisis averted. Because of our faith in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.